Okay. So good morning. Uh, of course, I'm talking to the students who are <laughs> a huge number present here. So this is the lecture five, um, which has a, the beginning of a title which is very, very general, large deviations. Obviously, this is such a huge subject that it is impossible to even give a kind of short introduction to that subject for students. But um, and of course, I will point in the direction of non-equilibrium. And so what I will do is just after a few reminders, because I think also students already have had some introduction to uh, large deviation. So after just a few reminders, I will try to concentrate on, on hopefully three ambitions, uh, which you have perhaps not seen, because they are not discussed so broadly in the standard literature, which is huge, on the subject. And these three little uh, goals of this one hour and a half would be, perhaps, that I would like to show you how the so-called minimum entropy production principle, which I will abbreviate as MINEP, minimum entropy production principle, you may have heard about it or not, I will explain what it is, uh, that it really follows from a large deviation uh, consideration. Okay, then the second ambition, uh, which is perhaps less common, I'm not sure, that is how um, large deviation functionals, in particular static large deviation functionals, also that I have to explain, give rise to a Lyapunov function. So I think that is also an interesting remark, how there is a connection between even a static large deviation function and the property of being Lyapunov, basically increasing in time under the suitable corresponding macroscopic evolution. That's also something which is not so often discussed. And then finally, maybe I will explain also a kind of structural thing. The structural thing is the following. Perhaps you have heard that um, relaxation close to equilibrium, return to equilibrium, maybe you have heard that this follows what is called the gradient flow. This has been in the news a lot, this gradient flow. Um, basically, it says that you do steepest descent with the appropriate metric for minimizing, for example, a free energy. So the question is how this gradient flow is related to large deviations, basically. And I will try to show you how um, the expression of detailed balance on the level of large deviations give rise to this, again, dynamical property of gradient flow. This is independent, by the way, of this Lyapunov exponent, uh, a Lyapunov function, but of course, that could be part of it. But it is a bit different still. All right, so three little ambitions that perhaps you have not seen too often in standard courses of large deviation theory. But before I do that, actually, let me uh, start with, uh, with a remark, and this is a remark which is perhaps partially, but only partially, in fact, related to a self-consistency. Because, you know, um, what about what large deviations, what is it about? It's really about fluctuations, right? Huge fluctuations, large fluctuations. So the word deviations is, of course, referring to fluctuations. And fluctuations is around what? Well, around the law of large numbers, I will come to that. But in, uh, in the courses, or rather in the lectures that we have had so far, I have been trying to emphasize the, the physics and the usefulness, the operational value of this uh, relation that I wrote down often, namely that we like to work now on path space measure and like to speak about probabilities of trajectories. Of course, if you speak about probabilities, you speak about all possible events, also strange, large, largely strange events. But the formula that I was exploiting, especially in the first lecture, and also in the lectures on response theory, was a formula which maybe you recognize in the, which I have written in the following way, right? There was this action, and I was saying that is a useful thing because it's explicit, you can compute it, and it has a meaning. That was the start of many considerations. So I would like for self-consistency also speak uh, maybe just five minutes, uh, add a remark to that, uh, to relate it not only to the first lecture, not only to the response theory, but also to the talk 
of um, Chris Arzinski yesterday, so that somehow you can understand how these things are related. It's not quite about, it's not only about large deviations, but large deviations will indeed also play some role here, and this is what I wanted to start with before I start. Okay, so first of all, let us be a little bit more clear about this thing. Uh, well, a little bit, really, because um, if I write here probabilities for trajectories, what I miss is, for example, to tell you um, what is the initial condition, you know, is there so, where do you start from, for example. So, in fact, there are versions, uh, version A is that you start all in equilibrium. So, what does that mean? You have prepared, like you did in response theory, at time zero, you prepared your system, even though you will perturb it later and get your system out of equilibrium, Nevertheless, at time zero, you are in equilibrium. So you have prepared yourself in a state of thermodynamic equilibrium. And so it means, uh, forgive me a bit the decorations that I will now apply just to make it more clear, is that if I, if below I will write the initial condition for trajectories that play on windows of time between zero and t. And on the upper part, superscripts, I will speak about the type of dynamics, okay? So, for example, if I write here things like that, that would be the abbreviation for, I start indeed, like we did often in response theory, from an equilibrium preparation, but I apply a dynamics which is perturbed or not perturbed, even just plainly non-equilibrium or time-dependent or what have you, okay? So, I do not remain in this pleasant, passive, deadly state of equilibrium. I do something which is more exciting. And then uh, this I can relate with an action again to something which has the same initial condition because I don't want to uh, mix up initial conditions with dynamics. So what I have to write here is then something like the equilibrium. And here I will write equilibrium. So it means that I'm remaining in this reference case. I would remain just in the standard um, equilibrium condition where I started with at time zero. Okay, now let us just compute something here. And the computation I would like to do is this thing. And I hope you understand my notation. First of all, let me first write it. It's a formal writing. Um, Okay, so it's a formal writing. So this average is, a, of course, an integral, a complicated integral over all possible trajectories. But let me abbreviate just by, you know, a sum over trajectories, just to be, uh, so that we are not too scared even, no? And, and the S, what is the S? The S is our beloved anti-symmetric part of the action, which is the, which is the, um, which is, according to the action, is the source of time reversal breaking. So in other words, it's A theta minus A, where this theta is the operation of time reversal on trajectories. Right? You remember that from, from before. Now, so that is what we are calculating. And then, um, indeed, how do you calculate these things? Well, you always use the same kind of trick, no? You well, it's not a, you just plug it in. You just get this. I hope, I mean, just follow me locally. It's not really a problem. Um, I'm doing things which are absolutely elementary, like substituting a formula. So I just substituted the first formula here. And then um, what I will use, of course, is that I will use now that I, the theta reversal is uh, an involution. So I can make a change of variables, whether I sum over parts of over theta, omega is the same. So I can as well say that this is the same thing, but I write everywhere theta, omega. Right? But now, um, this is again a triviality, but now let me see what I did really. Um, you see, the equilibrium started in equilibrium. That's just equilibrium. That's time reversal invariant. So this theta has no influence, right? It's time reversal invariant. Then S of theta omega. Well, S is by definition anti-symmetric under time reversal. So that takes a plus if I erase the theta. 
I hope you can follow. And then there I, I have here, uh, did I do, okay, that, that I leave, this I leave. And now I will multiply with e to the a omega, e to the minus a omega. So I didn't do anything, I just take another color. And I see that this, together with that, gives us, of course, again, our p in the non-equilibrium dynamics started from equilibrium. These two together. While, while these here give us what? Well, this gives us s of omega, but what we see here is e to the minus s of omega. So it gives us a 1. It's normalized. So what is the end of the calculation? We find that e minus s is equal to just a constant equal to 1, right? Just by playing the game that s is time reversal, anti-symmetric uh, anti under time reversal. But what is this s? Well, of course, we know that this, well, we know, I mean, I, I have been trying to explain that in various places, under the condition of local detail balance. You remember? Which is an extension of the detail balance, which is valid when you have reservoirs which are sufficiently spatially separated so that somehow every transition in the system is with respect to one of these reservoirs, and then I can apply locally the detail balance condition. Under such a condition of local detail balance, that uh, is just the entropy flux per Kb, right? That is what we have been telling us. That's the, that's the entropy flux per Kb. But now, suppose that, now I go a bit faster. Um, if this is the entropy flux in this environment, in all of this environment, then suppose, for example, that I just have non-equilibrium because I have a detailed balance dynamics, but which is changing in time, right? Then this thing that is dissipated can just be, is just the work minus the change in free energy divided by KBT. That's the dissipation that we have. Well, plug that in, in this formula, and this is what is called the work free energy relation that you saw yesterday, okay? That just to make it somehow, this formalism, how it fits with what you heard yesterday in the talk of Chris Jarzinski. Now, here I do not use any large deviations. This is valid for every time. So this is, a, but of course, I start in equilibrium, and I apply whatever dynamics I really like, and if it is local detail balance, and depending on the type of detail balance, I will have an expression in terms of thermodynamic quantities. Okay, now let us do case B, just to be complete. And here we see how large deviation somehow entered non-equilibrium in 1999 or around 2000. You know, these things are, like, these are kind of arguments that I am now presenting. I wrote them down in 1999 to 2003 in various papers. So this is all old stuff, but still relevant, I believe. So let me see how large deviations entered somehow the subject. Well, this is when I do exactly the same thing as here, but now I choose to start here. Here I take a steady state. So in other words, now I take a dynamics. Remember, the superscript is the dynamical part. The subscript is the is the initial condition, so I'm in a steady non-equilibrium condition now. And again, I do the same thing. I have a certain action on trajectory space, and now I have something a bit, uh, a bit strange, perhaps, and that is that I do, I start from non-equilibrium steady, uh, the non-equilibrium condition at time zero, and I let the, I, I erase, I take the driving away, and I go equilibrium. Okay? Now, is that okay? You understand what I'm doing? Let's see how this kind of uh, hocus pocus, well, hocus pocus, this kind of two-line argument, what it gives now. So I uh, can erase things, but in fact, I can leave things also. So what I will do now, maybe I will erase most of the thing. Let me erase. So let us now do something very ambitious. Let us compute the expectation of, an, of a function uh, in this steady non-equilibrium. So f is just an observable, which may be an observable in this window 
of zero t that I have been. So it can depend on the trajectory in many ways, all right? So I take its expectation. So again, in my childish writing, I do this sum over all the omega, f of omega, and then I have this p non non. And of course, the next thing I will do is to apply now formula two. So I will do that, and I will get here e minus a, p equilibrium non omega, okay? I just substituted, that's the equation number two. But now, before I do this trick with time reversal, before I apply this time reversal, there is something a little surgical in, uh, um, there is a little surgery that I have to do, because that is started in the non-equilibrium stationary distribution. I move under equilibrium, but that as such is not time reversal invariant for the trajectories. Right, I have to go really in this real equilibrium steady state. So I have to replace the non by, by the, I have to replace it by the true thing, by the real equilibrium. So I want to write here this thing because that is much nicer. So how do I go from here to here? It's just the initial condition that changed. So in other words, what I have to do is I have to write here if I have stationary distribution rho, if I have stationary distribution rho, I have to multiply with the condition, say, at time zero, and I have to uh, divide by the equilibrium stationary distribution at time zero, right? That's the price I have to pay. All right, so now there's two more, two more lines and I'm finished, so then I can really start. Now I do my theta involution, and what do I get? So now I apply the theta involution. So I get f of theta acting on omega. Now I get again the e minus a theta. Now this one is invariant, so I can leave it as it is. But I will get rho of xt divided by rho of equilibrium xt, right? And I forget the p equilibrium. Okay, and we are almost home now, because now I do exactly, I wrap it up again in the other direction. I have to just replace this again by that, right? And there are two things. There is the A that I have to apply, and there is this con co correction via the station, initial condition, okay? So in other words, what we get is that F non non will be expressed in an expectation in the steady state non-equilibrium, there is no perturbation here, it's just purely, it's non-perturbative in other words. Uh, the thing that I will get is um, E as before, I will get E to the, um, what did I get before? Uh, <laughs> I have to be, I think it's E to the minus S that I will get, yes. And then there is this correction, which is the exponential of something of a difference of logarithms, I will not write a full formula, but you understand this delta of log will be referring to the logarithm of uh, plus or minus the sign, I don't care for the moment, something like rho of xt over rho of x0 times rho equilibrium of x0, rho equilibrium of xt. I mean, I don't know whether the signs are okay, but that doesn't matter. So that is the correction that I now have. So you see, this is not such an incredibly nice formula now. Why? Because um, I have my f, I have my f theta, I have something entropy flux here, but I have this thing here, this e to the minus theta. And here, of course, is the following next remark crucial. And the point is that that is indeed a delta, meaning that this is truly something or what at time t minus something or what at time zero, right? Even though it is unknown because the stationary distribution, who knows what it is, it is a difference in time. And now this difference in time is of course just a difference in time compared to the S, which in non-equilibrium is extensive in time because it's the time integrated entropy flux, right? Per Kb. So it would be for non-equilibrium, it would be related to the time-integrated current and things like that, energy current, particle current, what have you. 
So it means that it's only by taking you know, the limit t going to infinity that I really make this difference between the two. In other words, I have to make you now the so-called fluctuation theorem, and that leads to the so-called Galavotti-Cohen fluctuation symmetry. When I take the limit for t going to infinity, I take logarithms so that this disappears, basically. I will not write here the specific uh, result of this, uh, of this exercise, but you see that here for the first time in this discussion of fluctuations to really have a neat relation which is of this following kind, which is the expression of a fluctuation symmetry, I really have to take a limit for t going to infinity. And of course, this thing here is, not, is time extensive, so it doesn't make sense really what I write, so I have to take some manipulations by taking the logarithm and dividing by time. I will not do that here, but you can look that up in the many, many references that have been written about that. But in the end, the Galavotti-Cohen fluctuation symmetry is a large deviation statement about the time-integrated entropy flux per unit time, per Kb. That is what the Galavotti-Cohen fluctuation symmetry is. So if we see yesterday um, these fluctuation theorems or relations appearing, one of them is in fact a large deviation statement, but then a dynamical one where you integrate over time and you look per unit time and you really have an expression about the large deviation functional, a symmetry in the large deviation functional. That it is what it is about. And as we were thinking about these large deviations, 20 years ago in time, somehow the whole theory of Lord's deviations, which was at the heart and beginning of equilibrium started statistical mechanics, started to come back. So let me remind you of these elementary steps so that we can have, uh, so that we can move. All right? So is there, are there questions about that? Yeah? No, no, I do, I, I, uh, just the contrary. Uh, maybe I should have done complete uh, explanation here, but you see, this is the entropy flux. In fact, I need that it is time extensive. It must be of order t when I look in my time window t, so that it is dominant with respect to this difference boundary term in the time window. That thing, boundary term, doesn't grow in time. It remains bounded. Most of the time, these things are just bounded in time. By the way, uh, Maybe that opens another remark. I mean, here I am saying that this is indeed bounded. This does, need not, this does not need to be always true, because think of the case where XTs are unbounded variables, you know, like oscillator type variables. Then in fact, you may have that the Lord's deviation, you know, I don't know whether you have seen these things, but okay, I will come to it. Lord, you think you take of sums, be it in time or in space, you take sums. But if you have unbounded variables, it may be that the large deviation just comes from one of the terms, right? Like a, this is called a condensation phenomenon, that really all of the blame is on the demo, not on the demo, on one term in the, in the sum, right? So if I'm saying that this time extensive part dominates the boundary part, that is indeed assuming not only, well, that is true, it's just a boundary term in time, but it's also assuming that as such, these things have bonded fluctuations. All right, so thank you for this question. It was uh, nice to add that remark. Okay, but with these remarks, we enter really into how large deviations entered into our world of um, non-equilibrium. Okay, so um, now let us go to our goals. And uh, as I said, let me quickly, 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 I, I will do it maybe a bit of a faster pace now, because I think you have seen these things before, no? Um, actually, maybe I shouldn't do that at all, but um, just uh, I, maybe it, it is, could be pleasant to see something that you know already, no? <laughs> Simplest examples. Okay, so first of all, um, as I said, the pioneers of... Uh, large deviation theory, they were not insurance companies, but they were statistical mechanicians. And um, there is the so-called Boltzmann calculation, which by mathematicians, in the case that I'm considering, is just called the Sandoff theorem. 
And uh, that is the standard case of Lord's deviation. So I will just write it, but maybe you have seen it. If you, if you think you don't want to hear it, you can also tell me. No? So suppose that I have uh, a nice random variable which is distributed with, uh, with rho. This is a probability distribution. And suppose that there are, in fact, n possible values. So this is just a discrete random variable. And then I take the case of IID, you know, n copies. So I have the copies x1, and I take xn. And the n will eventually be very large. So I have these n copies of the independent random variables. And now I am looking at some quantity which is called the empirical distribution. Namely, I'm looking at the fraction of uh, the copies which take the value x. So for all the x in the n values, so the n possible values, let's say that they are in a set k. So I'm looking at what is called the empirical distribution, right? This is a random variable, right? Because it depends on the, on the, on the variables, on the random variables, right? So that's the fraction. Uh, that take the value x. And then what is this large deviation about? In Sanoff's theorem, you're asking what's the probability when you're sitting happily in row for all these copies, you're asking what's the probability that this fraction of copies that you have x have a histogram which is mu of x. Right? Mu, is all, mu of x is another probability distribution. I'm asking how, what is the chance that I reproduce the histogram mu, right? Do you recognize that, students? Have you seen that thing or not? No? No, not seen. No? Ah, OK. Then, then I sh I, you should not let me rush through these things. Um, so I mean, uh, let me first give you the result and then tell you how you should do it as an exercise to obtain it. So the result is. Well, first of all, you can imagine that this is extremely small, this quantity, this probability, no? Because if n goes large, what do you expect? You expect you have n copies, independent copies, finite uh, random variables. So you have a law of large numbers. Typically, you see just rho, right? With probability 1, you see rho. That's the law of large numbers. But now you're asking about the deviation. Well, that you have to pay for that, no? If you want to, to deviate from the law of large numbers, you have to pay. So there will be an exponential minus n. And what is written here, that is called the large deviation function or the functional, really. It depends, of course, on your row, but of course, now it becomes a function of your deviation mu, OK? So that thing is called the Lord's deviation functional. It governs the fluctuations of, uh, of your system. All right. Now, what is, of course, what is the, what is the point now? Um, the point is that sometimes you get information about this, this governor this governor here, and that's the Sanoff theorem, or the Boltzmann calculation, that is just given by the relative entropy of mu with respect to rho, which is just the sum of the mu x, logarithm of mu, mu x over rho x. OK, so that's the result of this calculation. How do you get this? I mean, if you want to try it at home or in your room tonight, Basically, what you have to apply here, and in that sense, large deviations in its elementary form is just a subject of combinatorics, right? It's counting. And what you have to do here is the multinomial coefficient, which gives you the number of ways I can distribute things, no? And there you apply Stirling's formula on the multinomial. And for the rest, you just have to look at the energy cost, which is really the probability to have a specific realization. Combine these things, mix them together, OK, I will not do the calculation, but based on the Stirling formula, this is what you will have, OK? Um, so I, th I think it's better that I don't do it. First of all, I will lose time. I will make mistakes and all of that, but you should do it, all right? Um, so I will not do the multinomial, et cetera, et cetera. OK, so now, th so this was a computer, uh, this, this will be important, but let me postpone a bit why you care and why this is important. Let me first go to the so-called free energy method, which already sounds like you're trying to do uh, statistical mechanics, no? So what is the free energy method? It's just a physicist explanation of saying the following. Suppose I'm calculating now a function 
of this uh, mn. Okay. I have a function of this mn, and I do it like this, and I want to look in rho, and I want to do things like that. I want to understand things like computations of free energies, no? These kind of things for an arbitrary or hopefully sufficiently smooth function g. How do I do that? Well, again, in my rough way of uh, writing, this is basically 1 over m, the logarithm, sum over possible values, e to the n, g of m, and now the probability is, is this i rho of m, right? Isn't it? I mean, this is just my way of writing the probability of m, and that's just e to the ngm. And now you see this is like the standard calculation that you have been learning about for um, asymptotic analysis. Uh, this will lead to the supremum over all m, if all goes well, of gm minus this im. So in other words, we see that there is a relation, a duality, between a kind of what I will call, forgive me, well, maybe I should call it a log generating function. Maybe that sounds, but it's like a free energy. There is like a duality between some free energy and the large deviation function, right? And this, this goes via Legendre transform. I, I, I'm not being very precise. I'm not giving all the conditions, but that's the general. Can you understand that? Right, so you have, if you have a probability, you can compute these free energies, and you see that you get a structure of Legendre transform. In fact, um, you can take an example. No, you can take a g of m, for example, theta m. This is always for n going to infinity, of course. So uh, in that case, I would obtain things like that you may be more familiar with. So it's like a magnetic field or something, or a chemical potential, or a Lagrangian multiplier that I'm adding. This theta is just a, a number. And then you will get that in the limit, as n goes to infinity, this is like really the Legendre transform now, which is not here, um, of I of m. Sorry, I said Legendre transform, or I was speaking before I wrote it, really. OK, so this is a convex function in theta. And its Legendre transform is exactly this governor, this large deviation functional. So these things are, of course, much more uh, general than the setup that I'm choosing here. And if you look in the books, these are mostly known more generally under the gertner ellis theorem. So this gives you precise mathematical conditions on how these free energies and the large deviation rate function, large deviation functions are connected. Okay, now just to end this reminding session, uh, just to end this reminding session, let me add a little bit of salt. And the salt is here in the form of um, an equilibrium distribution. So in other words, let me now see what happens with this formula when I'm having equilibrium statistical mechanics. Of course, you know, I, haven't, I didn't speak here about a really an interacting extensive system. I should say that, no, this n here is the independent copies. But usually, we are speaking about a, a size of a system. So n would be like a volume, the size of a system. And the various random variables would be interacting. And then, even then, such formalism holds. In other words, there is something that like Gibbs distributions for sufficiently local Hamiltonians satisfy always a large deviation principle, always. And that is basically related to the fact that you can take a thermodynamic limit that the free energy always exists, which it means that the gertner ellis theorem is somehow always satisfied. OK? Hmm? Phase transitions included, but, but of course, you see, OK, let me not speak about phase transitions now. Um, so for the equilibrium distribution, suppose you take rho of x. I'm, I'm really speaking about like a finite dimensional context here, no? But the formalism is not very different if you go to really interacting system. So if you do this thing, then a small calculation says that this relative entropy, which is the governor, Right? This I call the governor, the large deviation functional. It governs 
the fluctuations, then you see that this relative entropy is really just a change of free energies. And that is somehow when Boltzmann discovered that, I'm sure that he got like a shivering through his, through his bones, right? Because suddenly, suddenly, okay, let me first say what is the free energy before I go to the suddenly. So the free energy F of mu I have no temperatures around here, or what do I? Probably I should know. Uh, you know, I will erase them, then I don't have them. Okay. Okay, so you remember maybe like in a, in a Helmholtz free energy, this is like the energy minus the entropy, right? So this S of mu, that is just minus mu log mu. Okay, that's the usual formula that you have seen for entropy, I think. Maybe in a more interesting context of uh, easing model or I don't know which models you like. Uh, this is also not to be confused with, well, you can confuse it at the right moment, but not all the time, with the Shannon type expression of entropy or the von Neumann expression of entropy, but that's not important here. So what I wanted to say about the shivering is that this is really a very important moment in history. Why? Because that is the moment when thermodynamics, you know, free energies have to do with uh, estimates of the, of, for reversible um, um, isothermal processes, free energy is like the work, changes in free energy is like the work done, right? So this is really thermodynamics. Free energies give us all kinds of things about um, how the state of the nature is. If you want to know whether it's a diamond or it is a, a piece of your pencil, it's a free energy consideration to see what is at the right temperature and pressure, the, the state of equilibrium, right? And how do you do that? You do that via this kind of thermodynamic variational principle. You have to minimize the free energy. And the minimum free energy corresponds to the equilibrium condition. Minimize over what? Well, over all possibilities. So here, in this framework, it would be like minimizing over mu. But indeed, we see that if you want to know when, when for which mu does that become one, which is typical, no? For what's mu? Well, it is, of course, for mu equal rho. We know that. That's the, that's the law of large numbers. But now we know much more. We know how it becomes equal to 1. It becomes 1 because it's exponential minus a change in the difference in free energy. You can show via uh, an argument which I'm not going to give, which is basically Jensen, that this free energy is always larger than that. So now you understand that where the variational principle come from, namely, you just have to have this one. You have to minimize this. So you, to find the mu, to find the equilibrium, you have to minimize f of mu, right? So that's how large deviations give rise to variational principles. All right. That's, I think, wonderful, no? So that's one of the reasons why people are interested in large deviations. It makes you understand variational principles. That's one of the reasons. Is that clear, this, uh, what I said? Do you understand how a variational principle now follows in this li very limited, mathematically very limited context, right? To know what is the mu that makes things probability one, yeah, you have to minimize the free energy, and that gives you another way of obtaining the equilibrium distributions. There are other reasons, of course. You know, why do you say, why do I ask the question why I care? Because as such, I mean, if you, from a very naive point of view, as a physicist, you could say, I mean, this is a large deviation. A large deviations I never see. Why would I care? Right? Because this is really, for n going to infinity, it could be a very unlikely thing, no? 
I mean, it's like asking that here in this room there would be like a, a droplet of water being formed or something. Well, it happens actually now and then, but you know, it could be a very strange thing, a large deviation. You're really looking at the extremes. Now, of course, sometimes extremes do happen if you wait long enough and what have you. Sometimes this does happen, but say, in many cases, if you do measurements, it's very hard actually to go to the tails of a distribution to know to, to really measure something, you know, this was also measured, uh, mentioned in the talk of Chris Jarzinski, to really understand these uh, certain relations, even for large deviations, that's not, you often don't see them. It's hard to, to get them really to be visible. But nevertheless, there are good reasons to look at uh, not only for large risks, not only for extreme event theory, but also intrinsically, for example, to do various new principles. There are other reasons, no? For example, I was speaking here about the log generating function, which is related to the large deviation. But of course, such objects, you can imagine, are as such very much summarizing much of information you like. Because take the derivative with respect to theta. It's called the log generating function for a reason. It generates all the cumulants. I mean, correlation functions, basically. Information about uh, correlation functions you will get indirectly from this formula. So, so that's a, a computational reason is that you get information about correlation functions of all kinds of objects that you're looking at. Um, okay, there may be other reasons. I'm not going to mention all of them, but there are good reasons and, and somehow foundational reasons are maybe most important to understand large deviation theory for such systems. Okay, so this was a kind of reminder uh, in my first chapter. Are there questions about this reminder and this formalism? Or not yet? So remember that in my first lecture, I wrote such a formula already for an interacting system. Do you remember? that I wrote for the equilibrium distribution of the simple exclusion process, which is boundary uh, with a certain boundary given by the chemical potential. I wrote a formula that the number of particles is given by a density, oh, no, bad letter, um, density, density, C maybe, L. I wrote a lot, so that, you know, the, the, the size of this system was L, and I was, saying in equilibrium you can try to understand the large deviations, namely what's the probability that the concentration is equal to C, and which is not directly related to the chemical potential mu here. And then I, I, I did not argue, but here is basically the argument that this is indeed given by the exponential of um, difference of free energy functionals per unit length. Uh, I will not write them again in full glory, but that was the formula that I had in lecture one, if you remember. Well, maybe you don't remember. These were the grand canonical free energies, really. So that omega, uh, oh, the notation is, of course, completely mixed up now. You see, <laughs> this is the chemical potential and has nothing to do with this mu. I'm sorry. So these are the free energies for a given chemical potential, and then this concentration is C. Sorry, um, it's just a bit confusing now, this formula. But I hope you, you will remember that in lecture one, I spoke about the probability outside phase transitions of um, seeing some different concentration in per unit length in my system for SEP, for example, um, compared to or for an interacting system even, compared to um, the chemical potential. So is that OK? Can I erase everything here as the reminders? So that's, that's the beginning of large deviation theory. This thing here. Ah, OK. So I, I, this is good that you asked me. So I, 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 this is a protection here, no? this, this wiggle. If you write wiggles, you can say everything, right? So there is a particular mathematical statement here. And the wiggle stands for the fact that there may be very much prefactors here, but they go to, they are not so dominant as that. 
So the right way to think of it is the logarithm and divide by n and take the limit n going to infinity and then if you take a minus sign, this will go to i of rho. Okay, even that is of course not a mathematical statement because I have another wiggle here, right? So I have to say what I mean by that the empirical distribution gives the histogram mu. Even that is not correct. So do you want me to, to add here a little bit to that? You see, uh, mostly it depends a bit on my space, but I can think about differences basically, and that they are smaller than some number delta. And then I have to take the limit as delta go to zero in the end. All right? But I can do it in many other ways. But your, the, to answer your question briefly, um, the wiggles here were uh, to avoid mathematical precision, but it was not an exact equality. It's in the logarithmic sense. All right? So, Lars, if, I, I should have said that from the beginning, if, but I thought somehow that these reminders were already known. Um, these large deviations occur in the logarithmic sense, absolutely. More questions about these generalities? No? Okay, then I think I would like to go to uh, the three ambitions that I had. Um, of course, I will ignore many, many things now because I don't have time to discuss about everything, but you can imagine that in the last two decades, a lot of uh, papers have been written, a lot of vast literature has appeared on uh, basically this this, uh, applying this formalism to non-equilibrium. So you get things like a current, you know, you, you have an average current. We saw in the first lecture, you can ask for the probability that the current goes in the wrong direction. That's a large deviation. But you can also look at the cumulants of the current. What is the log generating function of the current? You understand? So these are large deviation calculations. And sometimes, actually, people have been so clever that they have been able to calculate these things or at least find asymptotic behavior and all that. And uh, a lot of literature and a lot of excitement in non-equilibrium statistical mechanics has been related to this subject of um, large deviations in current, entropy fluxes, dynamical activity, and so on and so on. So I, I cannot just even start to review all that, but except for um, saying things which you cannot find easily in the literature. Um, so before, <laughs> uh, so let me, let me try to make a bit of structure here. Um, so as a section two, uh, or maybe it would be better to call them the types of large deviations. So there are, you know, large deviations refer to fluctuations around something. So we speak about static deviations when, for example, you're sitting in the stationary condition in non-equilibrium and you're asking about a density profile. That would be a static large deviation. So example, I will not be formal explaining what is static large deviation, just to give an example. You all know the simple exclusion process, right? So again, we have our setup that we say in one dimension, we have a lattice interval of size L. And we have these many, many sides because this L will be our N of the previous uh, slides. Um, suppose it is boundary driven, which does it mean? It means that there is an entrance and an exit of particles, and this happens at various rates. I will not define the model in detail, but you can imagine, no? So you should imagine indeed that here you have a left reservoir with some chemical potential, and here I have a right reservoir, and you get probably some current through the system from the high density reservoir to the low chemical potential. Okay, now a static question, or a question of static large deviation is the following. Look at it in its stationary condition. So it's not static in the sense that nothing moves. Of course, many things move, but you're stationary, all right? And you are not asking about a deviation with respect to time, but you're asking about a law of large numbers where this, the large parameter is the size of the system, so that you get many, many uh, sis, uh, si um, sides. And you are mapping this on an interval of 0, 1, 
somehow you can always think of an interval of 0, 1, but where the size of the system, sorry, the, the interstitial size is of size 1 over L. That's equivalent, no? So now what I'm drawing here is this 0, 1 interval, and I can ask for the probability of some profile. Now, perhaps you have seen this calculation in another course, but it's not so hard to see that the typical profile, the typical density profile, macroscopically, that you have is linear. Is that okay? The reason is because you just take, uh, you just look at how the density changes, and you find basically that the density changes via the Laplacian, and then by the boundary conditions you solve it, you get a linear profile, right? So the question about static large deviations would be, what is the probability that you see something different, something like that. Of course, you want to keep the same densities left and right, right? otherwise the probability would be zero. Right? So you don't want to be completely crazy. You're asking for a very strange profile. I tried to do something very strange here. So it really is a large deviation. And this would be a question of static large deviations. Now, people have been um, looking at that. And because this simple system is simple, SEP is sufficiently complicated, but also sufficiently simple for allowing various types of methodologies, such as the matrix product uh, real, um, um, uh, representation. You can do that, and you can find the functional that corresponds to that profile. This has been work that has been done by people like uh, Derrida uh, and others. Uh, I do not know the references, but... Derrida, Leibovitz, Speer, but also in the context of the so-called macroscopic fluctuation theory by um, people like John Lazzinio, Landim, Gabrieli, I forget, um, Bettini, people like that. So if you look at the review, there is a review in modern physics called macroscopic fluctuation theory. You will find this discussed in, in much greater detail. It's not, I'm not going to speak about that, that would take me too much time. But that's an example of static loss deviation theory. So, that in a way is the simplest realization of what I talked about for equilibrium. So, in equilibrium statistical mechanics, you had these Boltzmann, Planck, Einstein people who were doing macroscopic fluctuation theory, right? For example, a typical example is the paper of, what is it, 1911 by Einstein about why is the sky blue. There he applies large deviation theory to understand that, macroscopic fluctuation. Okay, what do we mean by, so that is an old story somehow, dynamic large deviation theory, that is where the large parameter is time. And instead of looking at around the law of large numbers, you know, the hydrodynamic equation is like the law of large numbers. If you look at a stationary equation, it's like the law of large numbers, and you look at deviations. Here, you look at ergodic averages. So maybe I can look at 1 over t, 0 to t, ds. And I look at the fraction that I am in a certain state x. This is now a fraction in time, right? Do you understand? This is, again, suppose xs is um, your favorite Markov process. It can be interacting or not, I don't care. Just a Markov process, say, in time. I look at it in its stationary distribution row, and I can ask what's the probability in this row that this ergodic average, this time average, is reproducing a histogram mu of x. Well, that, of course, is, is very small, this again, this number, as t goes to infinity. And as t goes to infinity, again, in the logarithmic sense that I mentioned before, you have that this will be going down in time. And the rate function, now we speak about the large deviation rate function, is again an i of rho of mu. But, of course, now it refers to a dynamical large deviation. Uh, clearly, this i rho of mu is positive, and the i rho of rho is equal to zero. And um, this is for mu different from rho. So rho is always 
you know, has this ergodicity property that it reproduces itself if you take large time averages, but probability one, and you ask for a deviation, and that's given. That theory is not so old, by the way. That theory, as far as I know, maybe I'm mistaken, but I think it disappeared mostly in the mathematical literature in 1975. That is the theory which goes from Domsker and Varadan. Maybe you know also, well, you know the names maybe, but Varadan got, for example, an Abel Prize related to these extensions of large deviation theory in the dynamical domain. So these were very important papers to understand how the structure is of these large deviations. Is that clear? I mean, not clear in the sense of that I said anything, but just to dig the difference with the static large deviations. There are other types of large deviations, but let me not uh, even write them down. But you can imagine that you have a stochastic process, say a diffusion process, and there is noise, right? So let the noise go to zero. Well, there is a deterministic equation that appears. Now you can ask what are the probabilities around that deterministic limit. So now the, the parameter that is large or small, depending how you say it, is the beta, is the temperature, for example. Right? The noise parameter goes to zero, and you can ask what's the probability that I see something different from the deterministic limit. So you have a deterministic differential equation, and I ask what's the probability to see something different because of the noise. That's called Friedlin-Wenzel theory. So if you want to understand that, that is the so-called Friedlin. There are books and oh, so much papers and other books. Uh, this is a, an example of another type of large deviation called Friedlin-Wenzel theory. OK. So just this is, uh, again, a little introduction to say that there are, especially in non-equilibrium, not only the statics, but also the dynamics is important. Because this Galavotti-Cohen fluctuation symmetry is really in that dynamical context, right? OK, now um, I'm ready to do a little calculation, which is uh, hopefully fulfilling my first ambition. Right, actually, I have, uh, oh, uh, uh, it's great, it's already on the blackboard. I will try to compute this I of rho for a simple Markov process. Okay, so I want to do nothing less than compute this thing. Is it okay? So this is for t going to infinity, right? Now, I will use something that is a general procedure in large deviation, and it is related to so called Kramer tilting. I don't know whether you have heard about this person, Harold Kramer. It's not the Kramers that we had for the escape rate theory. It's another Kramer. It's with a C, and it's more, it was more related to insurance and all that, insurance mathematics. But what we will do is the following. Here is the logic, and it's always the same logic. Oh, always. I mean, very often the same logic. You see? I have here a probability of some event. This, let me call this event, event. Why not? And what we are interested in is the probability of this event, which is, of course, probably a very unlikely event, and even more unlikely as t goes to infinity. All right? So here is the, the main trick in all of this large deviation business. So this is, of course, the sum of all possible trajectories, which are compatible with the event of the probability of the steady state starting in rho of omega, right? I'm using, again, this childish notation of summing of rho trajectories, but they must be compatible with the event. Here is the trick. The trick is you try to think of a process for which this event becomes overwhelmingly likely, has probability one, basically. So how do I do now? Well, suppose, just imagine, that this probability corresponds to a Markov process, and the Markov process has transition rates kxy. And this is your favorite physical process. It has a physical meaning, and that gives you the transitions per unit time, the, the rates for jumping between the states x and y, say some biological system or some magnetic system you choose. It's a mesoscopic system. The x can be multidimensional, I don't know, but it's not, not important. It's just... I have transition rates that determine a stationary condition. And I want to know what's the probability of the event. And I say, change it. 
and I want to change it into something which I will call kv of xy. And kv of xy is in fact very simple. It is the same xy, k, but I multiply with the change in this potential. So I change the, this, the, I change the dynamics. How do I change it? I take the original and I multiply, I open another energy channel if you wish. I open a channel with energy V and I say not only do I have whatever is in KXI which corresponds to the transition rate, but this V will now also play a role like, you know, this is like a change of energy that determines what is my new transition rate. And so here is now my own hope and in fact mathematically turns out to be a valid uh, expectation. That is that I can take such a V, not just any, but some very specific V, so that this event becomes typical. Okay? So the, the idea is there exists, and in fact, this V will be unique for ergodic Markov processes up to uh, a constant. There exists, in fact, a unique V potential. I'm not going to show that, but this is all not very difficult. In that's, there exists a unique potential V, so that the probability of in this V potential, so now I write here the superscript V to tell us, you know, we have changed the, the dynamics, that in the stationary distribution for this potential, this event is of probability one, or very, very much close to one. Okay, suppose we are able to do that. This is a typical trick of large deviations. You see what you have to pay, right? So now we have to see what we have to pay. How do we do that? Well, we just uh, divide and multiply with this probability of V of the event, right? Uh, of, well, let me put it omega. That's the way to do it. Okay, I did nothing. So now it seems that the price I have to pay, that's why I was speaking about paying, that is here, no? I just have to estimate this thing. Now, you understand that this always is giving rise to some type of relative entropy between these two things, right? So in other words, we can already think and see that this I rho will just be a relative entropy of one with respect to the other. I'm not sure whether you see that now already, but that's not necessary, but you can feel it. If you don't see it, you can feel it, that this will be important. But now the computation will give us the following. You see, suppose we are able to express this, then the rest will be the sum over omega of event of that, that will be one. So we have to understand this thing. Are you following still? I mean, nothing really happened. Just some idea, which is called Kramer tilting. I mean, this is just a general uh, technology of large deviations. The tilting means you kind of, you see, you, you, you tilt it away from its original. You can do it in many ways, but that's just one example of dynamical tilting. You see, well, okay, let me not see anymore. <laughs> let me just go on. All right, so, but... <laughs> But now we can use what we have been using for four days, no? Because what do we do? We write this P of omega rho, and we have an E minus A, which is the weight, compared to the V. That's what we have been doing all the day, all, all, all week. And, um, but now let us see what is this A. Well, the A is always, as you remember, the frenzy, which is this, this thing which is time symmetric, minus the entropy flux. But the entropy flux in excess, okay. Uh, okay, yes. The entropy flux in excess, uh, yeah, let me do it that way, right? I mean, always the same. But you see, um, I will not do the full calculation, but let you see and feel, <laughs> I hope. Um, Look, what is this entropy flux? So this is the excess by adding this potential V, right? But look what I have been doing. I have been just opening a new energy channel. 
So what is the excess? It's the excess related to that new energy channel, of course. But it's a potential, meaning the, it's not a force. It's a difference of a potential. So it's a conservative force, so to speak. So it means that the excess in entropy is just a change in, is just a boundary term in time. Right? I mean, it's just related, this S is just the change in V per KB. What do I mean? If I take a window over zero T, then the excess is just looking at what is the energy that has passed through that new energy channel, that's all. But this delta means that it is again boundary in time. In other words, in the spirit of Lord's deviations that I have announced already from the very first five minutes of this lecture, it won't matter. This S is irrelevant in my computation of Lord's deviation because it's just a boundary in time. So in other words, this thing, this action, and in particular the Lord's deviations, will be completely dominated by the frenzy. Right? By this time symmetric thing. But, you know, if you remember my elementary calculations with random walkers and things like that, you remember that there are two types of aspects in this frenzy. One is related to the escape rate, and the other is related to the activation. I was using the parameter A all the time in these lectures. But here I didn't change the activation. This is just, I added an anti-symmetric thing. I didn't change this. So there is no excess in the activation. In the, re in the reactivity, I haven't changed. The only thing that changes is the escape is the escape rate. So what is the D? It is just that I have to sum uh, my k x y minus the k x s v y summation over y. That's the escape rate. at time s. Do you agree? The escape from xs, or better to say, the excess. I'm not sure whether it's plus or minus, so I will use the usual thing that it is with a plus or minus somewhere. It appears in the change in the, the excess in frenzy is just here, the excess escape rate. Are you still with me? All right. Good. <laughs> but no, you see, it's almost done. We are all, well, almost done for the first part. We are looking at omegas which are satisfying the event. It means that the fraction is mu of, of being somewhere at time s on average. So in other words, you will not be surprised. I will write the result that this i rho of mu is just equal to what? Is just equal to the sum over x, mu of x, sum over y, kxy minus k a v, yes, of mu x of y. So that's the result. So what do I mean by v of mu? V of mu is this unique potential which makes this event one. Yeah. yeah, I will come to that. So uh, I, I, I did not do the fullest calculation to go from here to here, but you understand that in this thing here, the only excess that I have is the excess in escape rate. There is no other excess. So in other words, the change in escape rate is what I, what I wrote here. And it means that I have an I rho mu, which is here. So there are a number of remarks I have to make now. First of all, how does this depend on rho? Well, it depends on rho because I write k. And this k is, is I mean, to exaggerate the notation, this k of xy is, of course, the k v of rho of xy. Right? But v of rho is, of course, 0. It's the, it's the original thing. Because I have already rho, I don't need to add anything. So the reason why rho is there is because I, of course, have the original k. 
Where is the mu? Well, the mu is, of course, here. It's an average over mu, so it's the expected change in escape rate. But, of course, there is something, as Urna uh, correctly points out, there is here a potential, this unique potential that I have to find to realize mu. Okay? Well, uh, that is, of course, not so easy to find in general. That is something that uh, for, for which there are various things that you can do. So let me give you maybe two ways to approach this, this problem. One way is that you can say this I of mu, I rho of mu, is in fact um, the minimum of the expression mu over v So another way of writing this is to say I will not try to find the potential, but I will just take this expression and I take the minimum of all potentials. That will be the same. Right? So I will have to minim So I have an explicit thing which is parameterized by v. v is a function of many variables possibly, and I just minimize over it and I get this large deviation. That's one way to approach the question. Another way is to approach the question that I can make a dynamics which goes to v mu. So I can make a dynamics, which is a functional dynamics, because v is a function. I can make a dynamics, I don't remember what it is, but it is an elliptic differential equation, which in the stationary condition, if I numerically, so I can numerically use this equation to go to the v of mu. Is the stationary point of this dynamics. Right? So there is a dynamics which can produce this v of mu. I, I have to think what is the dynamics, but it's in the papers. That's another way. But obviously, this is, a, I mean, you cannot expect miracles, certainly for complicated systems. This field of mu will not always be just ready made for you. But is it okay for the moment? Is it okay? So just the sensation, I told you that one reason why we love large deviations is because it gives us variational principles, right? So here, sometimes you may wonder in your wild dreams, what is a variational principle to determine the stationary distribution of a non-equilibrium system? Well, here you have a variational principle. The variational principle is the stationary distribution is such that this will be minimized. So in other words, the excess frenzy, or the, here the excess and escape rate, will be minimized by the stationary distribution. I'm not saying for the moment it is a useful variational principle, but it is a variational principle, as all our deviation functionals give you one. No, I will make it into a useful one, but not in general. And that is the first goal that I wanted to do today. And that is the minimum entropy production principle. Can I do that? All right, are we, are we here? I hope it was not too complicated for the moment. I, I just computed this donsker varadon functional. Sometimes this is called the donsker varadon functional. It's per unit time, of course, right? And you see from our formalism, it is really given by this excess in a time symmetric quantity. But no, ironically, the point is that in a paper uh, with Karl Netochny, which uh, appeared in some paper, I don't know where it appeared, but we have a scholarpedia an article about it. I don't know what year, but this is together with Karl Netochny. If you want to know about the minimum entropy production principle, I don't know whether Scholarpedia still exists. There was a time where this was kind of coming up. I don't know whether it's still around, but I hope so. So we wrote a, a Scholarpedia article about the minimum entropy production principle. And there we also show what I uh, am going to say now. I don't know, did you ever hear about the minimum entropy production principle? Somebody, students, I mean? No, not heard about it, okay. Well, in Belgium it's very popular, the minimum entropy production principle. So, here it is. So I will not sketch all its details and all its whatever it is, but the idea is very simple. So the MINEP is 
has started like a, a thought and a fantasy, maybe a wish, where people thought, huh, um, you know, in equilibrium, the entropy production on average is zero. The mean entropy production rate is zero. So maybe the non-equilibrium stationary distribution will be such that its, that its expected entropy production rate is minimal, given everything that is around. So what does that mean? Um, let me introduce a functional, which I call the expected entropy production rate, so like the EPR. <laughs> it's like an EPR, but not the EPR paradox. It's an entropy production rate, which is um, in the distribution rho, and it is, the, it is what you expect to be your entropy production rate if you are having a statistics of your particles, maybe your velocities also, given by rho. Do you understand that more or less? I can give a mathematical expression. Maybe, maybe you have seen this, um, for example, for if you are on a graph, I'm not sure whether you're familiar with Markov processes on a graph, or, but it's something like that, I think, no? And this is just a very specific uh, expression that maybe you have seen. Maybe it's, it's one half, I don't know. But that's an example of an entropy production rate for a Markov process with transition rates Kxy. You recognize this to be the expected current in rho. Rho is not stationary, by the way. Rho is general. It's a functional. And that's like the affinity, no? This is like... The, 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 the force, so it's J times F, it's an entropy production rate. Do you recognize that? So, in fact, you can prove, if you are interested in mathematics, I don't think even that there, is a mat that there is a paper who discusses all these nice properties of the sigma of rho. In fact, I wrote here distribution because you can extend it not only to probability distributions, but to general things. This is a convex functional, it's a, it's a fine convex functional. And it has a unique minimum. So this looks a bit like that. Suppose I am able to express here my row, all my possible distributions on this linear axis. And here I have this entropy production. Then, in fact, for, uh, I mean, don't think of this as zero, but just as some reference maybe. In equilibrium, there is a minimum, which is zero. So I just write a convex function. Oh, this is like a convex function that I have. And then this is the equilibrium distribution, right? <laughs> if I'm out of equilibrium, then I get uh, uh, some other functional, which is again convex. And its minimum is something. And I call this minimum rho star. And in honor of, uh, of somebody who was not doing nuclear physics in the 1950s, I call this the Prigozhin distribution. Nobody calls it a Prigozhin distribution, but I call it. So there is a minimum for this entropy production functional. I just call it the, the Prigozhin distribution. Is it okay? Just a name. Now, right. now I can ask, what is it? Right? So the minimum entropy production principle or, or dream or fantasy was, is that the stationary distribution rho stationary is equal to rho Prigozhin. In other words, that you can get a stationary distribution from minimizing the entropy production rate, which would be great, no? You don't need to solve uh, equations, dynamical equations. You just have here, like, in equilibrium statistical mechanics, like a free energy type thing, except that now it is the mean entropy production, and you just minimize it, and you get a stationary distribution. That would be a great thing to have. But it's not true. <laughs> it's not true, um, but almost true. And it is almost true close to equilibrium. It means the following. There is a regime where the entropy production rate is not too close, where it is not, um, where, where you're close to equilibrium, where so the, entropy, the mean entropy production is not large. So in the linear response regime, basically, this, re this becomes true. So then it becomes a principle, namely, 
you can find to linear order in the non-equilibrium driving, you can prove that the stationary distribution equals the Prigozhin distribution up to, up to corrections which are nonlinear. This is, even that is not completely true. It is only true for systems which are even under the kinematical time reversal. So if you have velocities around, it's no longer true. Ironically, when you have velocities around, the minimum entropy production principle must be replaced by a maximum entropy production principle, but forget about that. So if we have variables like your favorite exclusion process or what have you, where you just have variables or overdamped diffusions, variables which are uh, not changing under, under velocities, then close to equilibrium you have that the Prigozhin distribution is equal to the stationary distribution. Okay, now, what is the point now? In this uh, Scholarpedia or in this other article with Karl Netochny, we were able to show, somehow uh, adding irony on surprise, that even though that this Donsker-Varadon functional is completely characterized by a change in the frenzy with the time symmetric sector, if you come close to equilibrium, in the appropriate sense, which I'm not going to say, we get that I rho mu becomes equal to one quarter, this is universal, one quarter, sigma mu minus sigma rho plus nonlinearities, which I'm not specifying. So in other words, this Donsker-Varadon excess frenzy is just the excess in entropy production rate. And hence, the minimum entropy production principle follows because we can find the stationary distribution by minimizing the Donsker-Varadon uh, functional. I forget where it is. By minimizing this thing, we can find the stationary distribution. So it means we have to minimize the entropy production rate, just like we did for free energies. We have to minimize the free energy in equilibrium. We have to minimize this entropy production rate to find the stationary distribution. So in other words, close to equilibrium, the linear response regime is characterized by the MINEP, and you can find it from a dynamical fluctuation, dynamical loss deviation estimate. Okay, questions about that? First goal, ambition that I tried to explain a bit. I mean, you see, this is the, one of the interesting thing of doing loss deviations is that you get variational principles. So that's an example of how you can get something. You have a general variational principle, but even, you know, if you do the static loss deviations, like in this work of Derrida, et cetera, this loss deviation functional, nobody knows what is the operational meaning of it, whether it is related to work or to heat, or anything which is operational in a thermodynamic sense, probably it is not, right? But nobody really has an operational meaning of these large deviation functionals. You can use it perhaps to do some calculations related to yeah, uh, large deviations indeed, but there is no operational meaning. So this is not what Boltzmann and company wanted of large deviations. They wanted to see an operational meaning because from there they built all of thermodynamics all the response theory and et cetera, all follows from this large deviation estimate. Here, we are still not understanding this at all. What is the operational meaning of the large deviation functionals? Okay, so I have two more ambitions and I think I will only very quickly do one. And I think I can do it probably in three minutes. Is it okay that I still try to do that? Okay, so the, I will not come to the gradient flow. I will just show you very quickly not quickly, but in a sketch, why the static loss deviations give you a Lyapunov function for a corresponding dynamic equation, even though you don't know what it is, even though somehow. Uh, so that's the only operational meaning we have for the moment for the static loss deviations, that is that they are Lyapunov functions. So let me give you that argument, which is an extremely simple short answer, uh, argument, and therefore, I think maybe I dare to throw it at you still in these last five minutes. So the dynamics I'm leaving, that was this giving rise to the minimum entropy production principle. For the static, I will now show that, so goal two was that static 
large deviation functionals or Lyapunov functions. At least, I hope. So first of all, let me remind you what, uh, what I mean by the static loss deviation functional, right? So we have uh, a kind of mesoscopic states, or maybe they are even microscopic, I don't know, but let me say mesoscopic. So a collection of X's. Hi, telephone. Um, and, and you can imagine that you associate with this macroscopic variables which I will be called M, and if you know the X, you have the macroscopic variable. So for example, you have the easing spins, or you have the occupations in your SEP, zero or one, and then the macroscopic variable would be the magnetization or a profile, right? This is the way you do things. And what do you mean by a static loss deviation function? Well, the static loss deviation function schematically is saying, What's the probability of such a macroscopic value? Right? And the answer is, it is indeed given by, uh, well, basically up to a parameter which is very large, you know, the size of the system typically, it is given by, an end, by a large deviation functional, which we can denote maybe schematically as follows now. But let me, let me be, um, let me write it a little bit different. Let me introduce here the letter S. Again, letter S. Oh, it's, it's, not, it's nothing to do with the S in the action, nothing to do with entropy flux, but it just reminds us of Boltzmann formula that S is equal to K log W to write the entropy of the macro state M per U, per, per, per N, right? Is it okay? I'm just trying to write the, uh, just the doing Boltzmann's formula for, for more general class of systems, maybe open systems, uh, driven systems, what have you. Okay, so I call S this large deviation functional, it's the entropy. Okay, so now, so I assume this large deviation principle with a nice entropy. And the second input that I will make is that I have an autonomous dynamics. Autonomous means that if I specify on the ma an auto uh, no, these macroscopic variables that I have here, they are not arbitrary, but they are so chosen that while I have Newton's equation, or I don't know what Langevin equation, or what kind of Fokker-Planck or Dita, whatever equation you have on the mesoscopic X, I assume, just an assumption, that, I, that these macroscopic variables are chosen in such a way that I have a consistent autonomous evolution for these macroscopic variables, right? For example, it would mean that if I have SEP, boundary-driven possibly, that I have a diffusion equation in terms just of the density profile. You don't need, it's a first order in time equation for the density profile. I don't need any other variables, it's autonomous. So let me try to write this in the following sense, that I have that um, the probability that m at xt is equal to phi t, given that m at time s is equal to some phi s, is equal to zero for all s less than t. So it means that there exists a flow phi of s such that I have this kind of autonomy. So what am I writing here? Suppose I know at time s what is the macroscopic variable phi of s. So suppose that at time s I know I am at phi s, this is my profile at time s then I know that the probability that I have phi t, which is obtained from a differential equation from phi s, that this is basically of probability one in this sense. Does it make sense? Yeah, so I have a differential equation, first order, and it's sufficient to, so it's autonomous in the sense that I only need to know the macroscopic value at time s, and I know the macroscopic value at time t. Right? This is autonomy, right? 
And all of these m's depend, of course, on n. Right? This m is really something that depends on n. No? All right? I'm almost finished. I'm almost finished. Actually, I am finished because now I just have to do two lines to give you the argument for the Lyapunov uh, business. So Lyapunov here, I will only mean it. I will not discuss the convexity of this S. <laughs> I just will look at the time monotonicity. So now I'm asking what's the probability of M X equal to phi T at time that, that I have, uh, um, sorry, that MXT is equal to phi T. I hope my notation will stand. So this I wrote like E to the N S of MT, right? I should write phi of t probably, no? So this is like phi of t. The entropy associated to this macroscopic profile I have at time t. Is it okay? So, hmm? Okay. Um, let me do it differently. Let me write this as, what's the probability that I am at uh, M No, sorry. Sorry, sorry. No, no, no. No, sorry. So that I have an MT, that, that is not, not phi T, MT. Yeah, sorry, it's a large deviation, right? So this would be e to the n S of MT, right? I hope I, I reach where I want to reach, uh, remembering the argument. So this will be larger, and that is the simplicity of the argument, than the probability of MT, given that at time S, say, I was at MS, times the probability of MS. I am afraid I will not get there. No, sorry, sorry, it is phi t, sorry, it is, it is phi t that I want. I want to know, so I have an evolution of my profile according to my hydrodynamic equation. And what I want to show is that the S corresponding to phi t is larger than the S corresponding to phi s. That's what I want to show for t larger than s. All right, so phi t and phi s are the macroscopic profiles given by my hydrodynamic equation. So now I'm asking, what's the probability that I have phi t? It's something, it's not, a, it's not necessarily the stationary one, right? It's just phi t. And so I'm asking, what's the probability of phi t given that I have phi s? Given that I have phi s indeed. Now that thing, if I take the logarithm of this and I divide by n, that thing goes to s of phi t, this thing goes to s of phi s, this is an inequality, and this, the logarithm one over n goes to zero. End of story. Okay, so that's how you prove that it is a Lyapunov function. So you don't, you, you need something, and what you need is autonomy. And it teaches us a lesson which is important for general statistical mechanicians and thermodynamics. Sometimes you get the impression that entropy is a bit of a subjective quantity, why? Because you can somehow mathematically, you can define it for every macroscopic observable, right? This one? Because there is another thing, no? It can be something different, right? Because this is the probability that this is phi t and you have to be phi s. Yeah, it's, it's not a complete thing, no? Right? It's it's really very simple argument, but you do you do need something, and that is the autonomy. And what I wanted to say, as these are my last things, so I'm using that this is of order one only because the logarithm divided by n goes to zero. I don't need strictly that this is going to one. 
you know, that's important even for bifurcations. I can have hieronymic equations with bifurcations, but I have not discussed this. But that would be, it could be that this is only one half, for example, and still it works. This works also for quantum. So this gives a general H theorem, this argument. So whenever I have a static large deviation and I know that my that my macroscopic variables are chosen in not in a crazy way, but such that they give rise to an autonomous macroscopic equation, then I know that you have an H theorem. So example of this theorem will be Boltzmann equation. Boltzmann equation is an autonomous first order in time equation. The entropy as corresponding to Boltzmann is just the H functional. It increases, end of story. You don't need to do any computation anymore. It's a general argument. Um, what I wanted to say, just this final remark is, you see, sometimes if we speak about Boltzmann entropy in that sense, it feels like, yeah, you can take your strangest, most, most crazy macroscopic variables. No, somebody says, yeah, I don't see colors, so I only take these macroscopic variables. So another person says, yeah, but I can feel heat. I can feel temperature, so I have to include that macroscopic variable. But the really test whether you have a good macroscopic variable on the correct level of description is, of course, that it gives rise to an autonomous dynamics. At least that's one good test. If you can really describe my macroscopic system in terms of these variables, then it's good. And, the, prior, and the, the, the present you get, the gift you get with this is that you get an H theorem. And the static loss deviation, even though you don't know it, will be a Lyapunov function. In other words, the static loss deviations somehow fit with the dynamical equations on the macroscopic level. Okay, that was my second goal. The third goal I have not reached, and it's already over time. Um, okay, I will say next time or something. Okay, thank you.